thoughts come and go. But we have a habit of latching on to them to try to make them stay. In fact, we've gotten pretty good at that. Without that habit, we wouldn't be able to speak. We wouldn't be able to hold conversations. We wouldn't be able to think anything through. So it's got its uses. But we also learn that it has its disadvantages. Many times it weighs us down with all kinds of suffering, all kinds of stress. When the mind goes overboard in its thinking. The skill in meditation is learning how to think when you want to think and not to think when you don't want to think. It's not putting yourself into a totally blank state where no thinking is possible all the time. On the other end of the spectrum, it's not a process of thinking all the time either. It's learning the time and the place for your thinking. The problem is the mind keeps offering up thoughts at the wrong time and the wrong place. Thoughts we don't want, but they come in. Sometimes it seems like the less we want them, the more insistent they are on coming in. That shows that you've left an opening for them. But in order to see that opening, exactly what you're doing that admits those thoughts, that is fascinated by them, you have to get the mind as quiet as you can. This is why in the process of meditation that there's a kind of rhythm that goes between periods when the mind is really quiet, nothing seems to be happening, and other periods when that's all that happen is happening, the other things, the disturbances. There's a kind of rhythm to the practice, and the skill in the practice is learning how to make the use of whatever level of concentration you've got to deal with the thoughts. In periods when the thoughts seem to be few and far between, you can't let yourself be complacent. Build up your concentration as strong as you can, so that when the next th wave of really obsessive thinking comes into the mind, you'll have stronger tools for dealing with it, stronger tools for not getting swept away by it. So keep this point in mind. When thoughts come in, remind yourself there always is a part of the mind that's not involved in the thinking. This is easier to realize when you've been working on developing a large frame of reference for your concentration. Once the breath gets comfortable, immediately move out and let that comfortable sensation spread to other parts of the body. Get used to having an en this enlarged frame. Because if your mind is totally one-pointed, focused on one little part of the body, it's very easy to knock it over. Because if one thought can come in and fill up that little one point, and there you, there you are, your concentration is destroyed. You're off on something else. But if your area of awareness has a broader base, all the way from the feet up to the head, all around the body, and if you think of that as a space, then when the th thoughts come and go, they have a space they can go through and they don't run into anything. They just go right out the other side. That way your concentration doesn't get knocked over by the thoughts, both because it's large and two, that it doesn't put up a surface of resistance. You can put up that surface if you want, but sometimes it seems to pen in thoughts and they get more obstreperous. So if you have to let them in, okay, let them in, but just let them go. Think of the body as this large magnetic field. There's nothing solid there. The thought comes in, it has nothing to run against, it runs out the other side. This way you begin to realize that you, there's nothing you necessarily have to fear about the thinking. You don't want to focus on the thoughts, but you have the choice of focusing on them or not if you want to. But it's always knowing that you don't have to focus, that you have a place to go to. That means you can have control over your thinking. 
We just switch back to that mode of that enlarged awareness and stay there. Now, don't think that that enlarged awareness is what the Buddha is talking about when he says, when he's referring to the unconditioned. It's more like his reference to the word dhatu, which means property. Back in the Buddhist time, they talked about the different properties that make up the body, different properties that make up the mind. And the basic idea behind the concept of dhatu, or property, might be closer to our word of potential. There's a potential for things to happen if it gets aggravated, if it gets disturbed, if it gets provoked. And if there's no provocation, it's all very still. This is how they explained fire. They said fire is lies latent in everything. And if you stir it up by a little friction with a fire stick, or nowadays with a match, that aggravates this fire potential that's lying there and it bursts into flame. The mind is like that as well. There's potential for thinking in every little cell of the body, it seems. Every little area of your awareness has a potential for a thought to arise, if it gets provoked. And when things are still and empty in the mind, it's simply because nothing's provoked. It doesn't mean there's no possibility of new things coming out. It's just they haven't been provoked. Sometimes there's a strong sense of light that goes along with this. And again, that's not the light of the unconditioned. It's the light of these potentials just waiting to be provoked. And you're having a good, solid blanket of light all around them to keep them from getting stirred up. So even when it seems like there's nothing going on in the mind, don't get complacent. Try to develop your awareness, develop your concentration. Develop this sense of space so that you're really proficient at it, that you can maintain it all the time. You can have this 360-degree sense of awareness. So when something does get provoked, you're quick to see it. And part of you say, oh, I thought there was nothing there. But there is. It's just that things are very quiet. It's like children in a classroom. As long as the teacher is in the classroom, at least back in the old days when the teacher was in the classroom, the kids are quiet. They'd wait until the teacher left the room, then they'd start running around. The teacher comes back in, they get quiet again. My older brother tells a story from when he was in grade school. He had a really sharp teacher. One day she left the classroom to go down to the women's restroom to have a smoke. The kids, of course, were running around the room until she, they heard her coming up the stairs, and everybody else in the room sat down very quietly, except for my brother, who continued running around. He was just so excited. So, of course, she caught him running around the room. So after the class, she took him aside and she said, Look, you've got to learn how to be sneaky. Listen for when I come up the stairs, then stop running around. It's the kind of teacher you learn to love. But this is the way it is with the mind. When we're very mindful and our mindfulness fills the body, fills our awareness, things get very quiet. But they're sneaky. As soon as your mindfulness slips a little bit, there comes a new thought forming in the corner. And then it spreads out to fill things up. But you can establish that larger frame of awareness again. It can go through and not do any damage. But it means you've got to be very alert, very non-complacent. And it's a kind of work. But then again, that's what concentration work is. It's work. But at least it's work in the right direction. Giving us a frame of reference from which we can look at our thoughts with, with more detachment less of a sense of involvement, less a sense of identification. For the time being, if you want, you can identify with that larger frame, that larger field of brightened awareness. After all, the process of identification doesn't end all at once. It goes from more 
blatant, obvious things to more and more refined things. So learn how to use it so you don't latch on to things that are harmful for yourself, for thoughts that pull you off into greed, anger, and delusion, that stir up all these other potentials that are there in your mind as well. So this particular step in the meditation, that once the breath gets comfortable, start spreading your awareness to fill the whole body, and then allow that comfortable breath to fill the whole body as well. It's an extremely important part of the meditation. When the Buddha gives 16 steps for breath meditation, step number three is just this step. He puts it right up there towards the beginning. When he talks about a mind and concentration, he calls it mahagatangjitang, enlarged awareness. The images he gives for the states of right concentration or images of enlargement. When you're first allowing that sense of ease and pleasure to permeate the body, he says it's like a bathman or a bathman's apprentice that would knead water through a ball of bath powder. Back in those days, they didn't have soap. They'd have a powder that was kind of like a flower. And then to bathe, they would make a dough out of it by kneading water into it. And again, you fill the whole ball of bath powder so that powder so that no part of it is dry and the water doesn't leak. This is the stage of working that sense of ease and pleasure throughout your whole body. In the second and third states of jhana, levels of jhana, it's the same sort of thing. You take the particular type of pleasure or rapture that corresponds to that state and you let it permeate pervade your whole awareness, suffuse your whole awareness, your whole body. They give images of a spring of cool water coming up at the bottom of the lake and permeating the entire lake. And the third jhana, which is more, uh, more quiet and less in intensely rapturous state, he said that's like still lotuses in a still pool of water permeated entirely by the, the water of the lake. In the fourth jhana, it's a, someone with a bright cloth surrounding the body, bright white cloth covering the whole body in the same way your bright awareness fills the whole body. So it's obvious that this state of broadened awareness is really important. The images, the descriptions stress it over and over again. Because so on the one hand, it gives you a basis so that you don't get knocked over by distracting thoughts. It opens up your vision so it becomes more all around. 360 degrees all around you. So that you're aware of all these little potentials in the body, all these little potentials in the mind that can get provoked one way or another. So you can be quicker and quicker to see the very early stages of provocation so that when the slightest stirring comes, You'll begin to notice it's not so much a physical stirring or a mental stirring. It seems to be on the borderline between the two. When you latch on to it, there'll be a little bit of tension that you create in the body in order to create a place for the mind to latch on to it. So thinking is both a mental and a physical process. If you have this broadened state of awareness, you can dissolve that little swelling that begins to turn into a thought and then can take over your whole awareness if you're not careful. But when you're operating on this area where the bind, mind and the body meet, physical, physical and mental phenomena are right at that borderline, you can deal more and more quickly with the beginning of anything, any potential that would come, either in the body or the mind. This is why concentration is such an important state for gaining insight. Because it improves your vision, it makes it all around, it makes it more precise. It focuses it on the proper area where things start, this interface between body and mind. So that if you want to think, okay, you can think. If you don't want to think, you don't have to think. When the time comes that you really need to think, the mind will have been properly rested. Your thinking will be a lot clearer, more to the point. 
the time comes to stop, you can keep your thinking under control. It doesn't keep riding all out in all directions. Most people's thinking is like a, and a nuclear reaction. This little neutron goes out, that one runs into this other nucleus, and that sends something out, and then all of a sudden the whole thing multiplies until it's way out of control. Concentration is like those graphite rods that they keep in a nuclear reactor to make sure the reactions don't go beyond out of control. If you want to shut everything down, you can put all the rods in all the way, and everything is still. That doesn't mean the potential for reaction isn't there, it's just it's been stilled. If you do need to think, oh, you can pull out the rods a little bit to get just the reaction you want. Okay, then when it's done its work, you push the rods back in. And this way, when thoughts come and thoughts go, you get whatever use you want out of them but they don't take over your mind. You stay in control. 